Welcome to Spiritual Mentoring Group. Today is September 24th, 2017. It is the day after Shabbat, after Rosh Hashanah. And today was the Feast of Gedalia. <laughs> Not the Feast, it will be one day, but the Fast of Gedalia. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. Please excuse my rough voice. I seem to be losing my voice. I'm not sure what's going on. Maybe it was talking for three days. Um, like I said, I had almost my whole family with us for Rosh Hashanah. Um, we were 16 to 18 people for seven meals, um, and it was quite an adventure. It was very interesting having my whole family, or almost my whole family, here for three full days and um, my Hebrew birthday is second day Rosh Hashanah so my birthday was on Thursday no my birthday was on Friday and uh, my daughter-in-law made a beautiful beautiful birthday cake if you didn't see it posted I think it's on my timeline on Facebook and um, anyway it was a wonderful celebration I was able to give everybody brachas and uh, at the end of class today I'll give you guys brachas and uh, anyway, so as we've discussed in previous classes, Rosh Hashanah is always two days long, whether you live in Israel or not. There's only two holidays that don't change that are celebrated for the same amount of time in Israel and outside of Israel, and that's Rosh Hashanah, which is always two days, both in and out, and Yom Kippur, which is only one day, both in and out. All of the other biblically mandated holidays are kept for two days outside of Israel. And it has uh, to do with um, the fact that they are not, like the land of Israel itself has a certain level of holiness that outside the land of Israel just you just don't have. Now, it, that's not where it originates from. It originates from the fact that um, holidays in Rosh Chodesh and things were determined by um, witnesses and so sometimes uh, there was a question which day was the right day to celebrate uh, and outside of Israel news takes longer to get there um, I think there's a variety of other reasons also given I'm not a hundred percent sure where the tradition started specifically but um, for a very very long time it's been the case that all of the biblically mandated holidays are kept for two days outside of Israel one day inside of Israel, except for Rosh Hashanah, which is always two days, and Yom Kippur, which is always one day. Why is Yom Kippur only one day? Because it would be very detrimental to people's health and could put people in danger if they were asked to fast for two days. And uh, so it's just not done. And Rosh Hashanah, well, I'll explain to you in a minute. So um, this Shabbat, we had, in addition to our family, we had a couple which are kind of like our adopted family. And the, the husband is a rabbinical student. And he gave us an in interesting insight uh, as to why Rosh Hashanah is only two days. So I'm going to share kind of a, a little bit of a, an explanation that came out of this insight that he shared at the table. Um, now, like I said, as you know, the uh, Jewish, the beginning of the month, Rosh Chodesh, this is the first day of each month, is a holiday, right? We've gone over that a few different times. And um, you may or may not be aware that some Jewish months have two days of Rosh Chodesh and some only have one day of Rosh Chodesh. And the reason for this is because the lunar month, which is what the Hebrew calendar goes by, is approximately, it's very, very close to, 29 days and 12 hours long. It is literally 29.5 days long. And so um, 29 isn't accurate and 30 isn't accurate. So in the Jewish calendar, one month has 29 days and the next month has 30 days. And that way we even out the number of days so that every two months we're still, we're on track, okay? And uh, of course, that still doesn't give us the right amount of days to keep up with the solar calendar. And because the Torah tells us that the month of Nisan is in the spring, 
uh, we know that the solar calendar is also important and that the lunar calendar has to be reconciled to the solar calendar. So every few years we add a leap month instead of a leap year every four a leap day every four years in like in the american calendar in the hebrew calendar we add a leap month every few years and it's calculated out i'm trying to remember if it's like seven out of every 19 years or something like that but it's calculated out so that the over the course of a certain number of years, the Hebrew calendar and the solar calendar stay in sync. The, um, the Muslim calendar is also a lunar calendar, similar to the Jewish calendar. And uh, their months start on the same day that the Jewish months start on, but they don't ever reconcile their calendar to the solar year, which means that each month travels around the seasons. So one year Ramadan might be in the summer and a few years later it might be in the middle of winter. Now during Ramadan the Muslims fast during the day just like we did today but they do it every day for the entire month. During the winter that's not so hard. The days are short and they're cool. You don't get dehydrated. But uh, during the middle of the summer, that can be very physically demanding for them, especially those who have jobs that are physically demanding. One summer when we were moving, the movers that we hired had a few people on their staff who were Muslims. And they were moving our household goods in the middle of the day in July, and they weren't eating, and they also weren't allowed to drink until sundown. So um, it's not, not easy, but the Jewish calendar is reconciled to the solar calendar so that, I mean, it does move a few, a few you know, like weeks over the course of each cycle. Um, for example, my English birthday is October 6th, and uh, my Hebrew birthday is the second day of Rosh Hashanah. Now, it turns out that October 6th, approximately, is just about the latest that Rosh Hashanah can ever occur. Sometimes Rosh Hashanah occurs early in September, and sometimes it occurs as late as uh, the, the first week of October. And so we definitely have some movement in the seasons. Sometimes a holiday is going to end up being colder or hotter, but in general, it still stays within that framework so that um, Passover is always in the spring and Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot are always in the fall. So um, back, 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 back 2,000 years ago when we had a Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin is kind of the rabbinical religious supreme court, if you will, uh, back then, the calendar was not set. The days, um, which month had how many days was determined by witnesses who would be sent out to watch for the crescent new moon. So every month, the Sanhedrin would assemble on the 30th of that month, okay? And... Um, to see if witnesses would arrive and declare that day to be Rosh Hashanah, uh, sorry, declare that day to be Rosh Chodesh. If the witnesses came on the 30th day, basically saying that that day is now the first of the next month, then the month before is only a 29-day month, and that 30th day now becomes the first of the next month. Um, so, so that month would be a 29-day month. I mean, yes, it's kind of after the fact. You don't ever know back then. You didn't ever know if the, the, the 30th day would end up being the 30th of the previous month or it would end up being the first of the next month. But if a witness came forth and said, okay, it's the new moon, it's the new month, then the previous month was a 29-day month. And there is one day of Rosh Chodesh. Okay, so if the witnesses came on the 30th day, the previous month would be a 29-day month. In, day, in 30-day months, 
because the 30th day is always potentially Rosh Chodesh, the 30th day of the month is celebrated along with the first day of the following month as Rosh Chodesh. And so there's a two-day Rosh Chodesh for that month. So in other words, the 30th day is always a Rosh Chodesh. The question is whether the 30th day is the first of the next month, or if it's not, then the first is the next day and you have a two-day Rosh Chodesh. Does that make sense? So um, the following months always have two days of Rosh Chodesh. That is, there, there are uh, five months that always have two days of Rosh Chodesh, meaning that the previous month was a 30-day month, so the first day of the month plus the last day of the previous month. So um, Cheshvan Adar and Adar Bet. The second Adar is the month that is added as a leap year, a leap month every few months. Er Tammuz and Elul. All right, months that always have one day Rosh Chodesh are Tishrei, Shvat, Nisan, Sivan, and Av. There are also two months that fluctuate. Kislev and Tevet. Some years they both have one day of Rosh, Rosh Chodesh, some years they both have two days of Rosh Chodesh, and some years Kislev has one day and Tevet has two days of Rosh Chodesh. But the Rosh Chodesh of Tishrei, which is Rosh Hashanah, is the only holiday which falls on Rosh Chodesh. Passover and Sukkot occur on the 15th of the month, Passover on the 15th of Nisan, uh, which is spring in the spring, Sukkot, sorry, Sukkot, which occurs on the fifteenth day of the of Tishrei, which is coming up very soon. Today is the fourth day of Tishrei, and Yom Kippur is the tenth. So Yom Kippur is in six days. This year, Yom Kippur is going to be on Shabbat, which we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so Shavuot, so I said that Passover and Sukkot both occur on the 15th day of the month. Shavuot, which is 50 days after the 15th of Nisan, or Passover, is the 6th of Sivan. So Passover and Sukkot are on the 15th of a month. Uh, Shavuot is on the 6th of the month. Yom Kippur is on the 10th of the month but only Rosh Hashanah occurs on the first day of a month. So when Rosh Hashanah, when Rosh Chodesh was designated by witnesses rather than set by the calendar, which we, the, the way it is now, it's, it's set, but back then when it was designated by witnesses, any given month could be 29 or 30 days, including Elul, the month before Rosh Hashanah. This is because the fact, because of the fact that each month is 29 and a half days. So depending on several factors, it can shift one way or, or another, depending on when sunset falls and, and how all of that works. Okay, so once the new moon was sighted, it would officially be Rosh Chodesh, right? So all the other months, it doesn't matter. But for Tishrei, it's a problem because once um, it was a once the new moon was sighted, it was officially Chag, and if you didn't know it was Chag, you would have violated the holiday. So by declaring Rosh Hashanah two days always, everyone knew that at least one of those two days was truly the Chag, the holiday. But both days together guaranteed that the proper day would be celebrated. Does that make sense? Okay, so the day after Rosh Hashanah is a fast day called Tzom. Tzom is another word for a fast. There's two different words for fast, Tanit and Tzom. Um, and um, Tzom Gedali is always the day after the second day of Rosh Hashanah. Now this year, Rosh Hashanah was on Thursday and Friday, which meant it ran straight into Shabbat. The day after Rosh Hashanah, or the third of Tishrei, which is the date of this minor fast called 
Tzom Gedalia, it's a minor fast day on the Jewish calendar. And except for Yom Kippur, though, we're not allowed to fast on Shabbat. So Tzom Gedalia and any fast which is not Yom Kippur, so there's six fasts on the Jewish calendar, and five of them can never occur on Shabbat. Only Yom Kippur can occur on Shabbat. Um, all the other fasts, if they, according to the calendar, would occur on Shabbat, are pushed off until Sunday. The reason for the prohibition against fasting on Shabbat is that Shabbat is supposed to be a time of celebration, and we're not supposed to do anything that is overly uncomfortable for us or risk our, our health, such as fasting. Now, the words of the Gemara are that we're not supposed to fast until midday on Shabbat. The reason for this is that um, there are apparently many people who have a custom to fast just part of the day every day or on certain days. So um, apparently it's very common for somebody, for some people to fast until midday every day of the week. So the wording in the Gemara is you're not allowed to fast until midday on, Sh on Shabbat. You can do it every other day, but you can't do it on Shabbat. But the problem is, is that in many places, the prayer service lasts at least until noon. And so not eating before going to services, which is what the halacha technically is, would result in fasting for at least half the day or until midday. And for most of us, fasting is uncomfortable and many of us it makes us feel ill or you know at least a little you kind of go like oh i'm hungry mm, maybe i should get something to eat so the but the gemara says that if a person usually fasts until midday like that's their custom and they do it every single day and that eating something before in other words changing their schedule would actually make them feel uncomfortable or sick to their stomach or ill because that's not the pattern that they normally follow, then he is permitted to fast until noon on Shabbat. Because for him, fasting is comfortable and not fasting is uncomfortable. For the rest of humanity, us mere mortals and normal people, or not normal, but you know what I mean, um, Fasting until midday is uncomfortable, and so we're not permitted to fast on Shabbat. And certainly you're not allowed to fast all day on Shabbat, because there's nobody who fasts all day every day, because that's a difficult way to live. All right, so even though Sunday, um, sorry, even though Shabbat was technically Tzom Gedalia this year, the fast was moved to Sunday, which was today. But who was Gedalia and why do we fast? Before I get into that, though, you may remember when we first started learning together, I explained to you that there are six fasts on the Jewish calendar, and they can be remembered by a mem memnonic, I can't even say the word, long, short, black, white, male, female. All right, six fasts. One long, one short, one black, one white, one male, one female. The long refers to the 17th of Tammuz, which is a fast that usually occurs late in June or early in July. Short refers to the fast of the 10th of Tevet, and it's short because it's in the winter, and both of those are only daytime fasts. So, Everything except Tisha B'Av and Yom Kippur is a daytime fast. Um, so the long is the one that occurs in July, and the short one is the one that occurs during the winter. Black refers to Tisha B'Av. Tisha B'Av is the saddest day of the Jewish calendar. It's a day of mourning, so that's why we call it black. White refers to Yom Kippur. Pretty obvious. It's the day of atonement. It's when we're, we dress in white as a symbol of purity, okay? Male refers to the fast of Gedalia, which is what is today, and female refers to the fast of Esther. All right, and those are the six fasts on the Jewish calendar. 
Although on, the only one of these fasts that's biblically mandated is the, is the fast of Yom Kippur, all of them, not true. One of them is not. I wrote all of them are mentioned in the Tanakh. The one, uh, the one that's not mentioned in the Tanakh is the fast of Esther because that is mentioned in, I mean, it is mentioned in the Tanakh because it's in the book of Esther. But there's a back passage, a reference in Zechariah, Zechariah, chapter 8, verse 19, which mentions the other four fasts, which is really quite fascinating. So the, the Yom Kippur is mentioned in the Torah. The fast of Esther is mentioned in the book of Esther. And the other four fasts are mentioned, even though they're not biblically mandated, they are actually mentioned as a, a form of prophecy in the book of Zechariah, chapter 8, verse 19. And it says, thus says the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth, the fast of the fifth, the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth will become joy, gladness, and cheerful feasts for the house of Judah. So love, truth, and peace. So we have this, this prophetic passage which tells us that there's going to come a time, ostensibly when the Mashiach comes, that the fast days, at least those four, are going to be changed into days of feasting. And all four of those fast days are commemorating a, um, an event that led to the destruction of one of the two temples, or had to do with the destruction of one of the two temples, okay? So the four that are referenced in the passage are the fast of the fourth month. The fourth month is Tammuz. The fast of the fourth month is the 17th of Tammuz. The fast of the fifth month is Tisha B'Av. The fast of the seventh month is Tzom Gedalia. Even though we call this Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the year, it's only the beginning of the year because it's, it's the beginning of the the it's the anniversary of the creation of mankind and the anniversary of the creation of the world. But because, hum, because the Jewish people are not supposed to be of this world, so to speak, we're supposed to be of a spiritual realm. We're supposed to live in the spiritual realm, even though we have to also live in the physical realm. The physical world does not uh, rule us. It's the spiritual realm that rules us. So even though Rosh Hashanah is the anniversary of the creation of the world and it's the judgment day for the entire world, Passover or the month of Nisan is the first of our months because we go by the spiritual calendar. Okay. And so um, we count the months beginning in Nisan not beginning in um, in Tishrei. So Tzom Gedalia, which is only one day after Rosh Hashanah, is actually the seventh month. So the fast of the fourth month was the 17th of Thomas. The fast of the fifth month is Tisha B'Av. The fast of the seventh month is Tzom Gedalia. And the fast of the 10th month is the 10th of Tevet. All right, now I'm going to post... Uh, to the Facebook group after our class, the months of the Hebrew calendar are Nisan, that's number one, Er is number two, Sivan is number three, Tammuz is number four, Av is number five, Elul is number six, Tishrei is number seven. Maybe I should... Okay, so now you can see the, um, the calendar right? So Nisan is the first month and it has 30 days. Nisan is the first month. Er is the second month. Er has 29. Why does Er have 29? Because Nisan has 30. Sivan is the third month. It has 30. Tammuz has 29. Av has 30. Elul has 29. Tishrei has 30. Cheshvan fluctuates between 29 and 30. Kislev also fluctuates between 29 and 30. Tevet has 29. Shavat has 30. And Adar has 29. 
I'm trying to remember if a dar two, second a dar, excuse me, second a dar. I think that one also may, I think that one actually may also have 29 like first a dar. Um, mm. Now I can't remember because I didn't write it down. So anyway, if you add up the totals, um, the Jewish calendar without a leap month has either 353, 354, or 355 days. When we add back in the uh, second Adar, then it brings it up to 380 something days. But because of the way that they space it, it averages things out to approximately 365 so that um, it is um, it is aligned with the holiday, with the uh, seasons. Okay, so Tsom Gedalia com commemorates the assassination of a righteous governor of Judea immediately after the destruction. <coughs> immediately after the destruction of the second temple, and his death marked the end of Jewish autonomy in Judea at the time. All right, so what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to read to you the passage from Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah chapter 40 and 41, but I hadn't thought of it before. What I'm going to do is just add it in here. All right, and that way you can kind of read along with me. Hopefully it's big enough for you guys to actually read. Um, but like I said, this story can be found in Yirmiyahu chapter 40 and 41. It says, the word which came to Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah, from Hashem after Nebuzaradan, captain of the bodyguard, had released him from Ramah when he had taken him bound in chains among all the exiles of Jerusalem and Judah who were being exiled to Babylon. Okay, so um, this is during the Babylonian exile, and... Um, I'm assuming, I don't remember the story, I have to, I should have read the whole thing first, I'm sorry, uh, but uh, they had a prison in Ramah where they would hold people uh, before they decided what they were going to do with them, whether they were going to ship them off to Babylon or, or leave them in Israel. So chapter two says, now the captain of the, uh, sorry, verse two, now the captain of the bodyguard had taken Yirmiyahu and said to him, the Lord your God promised this calamity against this place, and the Lord has brought it on and done just as he promised, because you people sinned against Hashem and did not listen to his voice. Therefore, this thing has happened to you. But now I am freeing you today from the chains which are on your hands. So remember, this is Hashem speaking to Yirmiyahu. Okay, this is Hashem speaking to the prophet. And he's telling him that the whole reason for the exile was because we sinned. And he told us ahead of time. He told us in the Torah that if we didn't keep the commandments that we were going to be exiled from the land. Okay? So he says, <clears throat> But now, behold, I'm freeing you today from the chains which are on your hands. If you would prefer to come with me to Babylon, come along and I will look after you. But if you would prefer not to come with me to Babylon, never mind. Look, the whole land is before you. Go wherever it seems good and right for you to go. As Yirmiyahu was still not going back, he said, go on back then to Gedaliah. Wait a minute. This is not Hashem. Wait a minute. After... Now the, sorry, it was not Hashem speaking. I mean, it was, was Hashem speaking through Yirmiyahu, but it was 
the captain of the bodyguard, sorry, of the bodyguard who had taken Yirmiyahu. And he's telling him, he's heading back to Babylon and he's telling Yirmiyahu he's free and he's free to go. And he can either go with him to Babylon, which is where most of the Jewish people were, or if he wanted to, he can just wander around Israel, which was pretty, uh, pretty empty at the time, which is interesting because um, the captain of the bodyguard told Yirmiyahu that this happened because Hashem promised it because we sinned. It's very kind of harsh, but anyway. So <clears throat> he said to him, you can come along with me to Babylon and I'll take care of you. I'll look after you. I'll protect you. But if you prefer not to come with me to Babylon, never mind. You know, look, the whole land is before you. Go wherever it seems good and right for you to go. <clears throat> As Jeremiah was still not going back, he said, go on back then to Gedaliah, son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, whom the king of Babylon has appointed over the cities of Judah and stay with him among the people or go anywhere it seems right for you to go. So what happened was the king of Babylon had assigned this guy named Gedaliah as the governor of the Jewish province, right? Basically, they emptied out almost all of Israel, but they didn't take everybody. And so they assigned a Jew to be governor of the land. And of course, he was to report back to Babylon and probably to afford any taxes or whatever. So the bodyguard says, you can come with me to Babylon, I'll protect you. Or you can go to Gedaliah and be with him. And I guess that's where most of the Jewish people were. Or you can just wander around. You know, you can do whatever you want. So and he says at the end of verse five, or else go anywhere it seems right for you to go. So the captain of the bodyguard gave him a ration and a gift and let him go. Then Yirmiyahu went to Mitzpah to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, and stayed with him among the people who were left in the land. Now all the commanders of the forces that were in the field, they and their men, heard that the king of Babylon had appointed Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, over the land, and that he had put him in charge of the men, women, and children, those of the poorest of the land who had not been exiled to Babylon. This was the remnant. <laughs> so they came to Gedaliah at Mitzpah, along with Ishmael, son of Nathaniah. And even though his name is Ishmael and it sounds like he's not Jewish, he is Jewish. I guess at the time it wasn't considered a bad thing to be named Ishmael, since Ishmael was kind of an uncle, if you will. Uh, along with Ishmael, son of Nathaniah, and Yochanan, and Yochanan, the sons of Karia and Sariah, the son of Tanhumet, and the sons of Ephi, the Neto, Netophathite, uh, and Je, Je, Jezaniah, the son of the Makathite, both they and their men. Okay. Then Gedaliah, the son of Achikam, son of Shaphan, swore to them and to their men, saying, Don't be afraid of serving the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans is another word for the Babylonians. Stay in the land and serve the king of Babylon, that it may go well with you. So remember, Gedaliah is a Jew, and he loves Israel, and he loves his people, but he's been assigned a government official of the government of Babylon to oversee the Jews that are in that are remaining in Israel. And he's telling these people, don't, you know, just go off and be rogues and whatever, but stay here and, you know, serve the, the Babylonians, stay in Israel, serve the king of Babylon, and it'll be better than if you try to run away to Iraq or Iran or, or, or some other country. <clears throat> stay here and life will be pretty decent. Now, as for me, behold, I am going to stay at Mitzpah to stand for you before the Chaldeans who come to us. But as for you, gather in wine and summer fruit and oil and put them in your storage vessels and live in your cities that you have taken over. 
Likewise, also, all the Jews who were in Moab. Now, now Moab is in Jordan, but back then Moab was part of Israel, but on the other side of the Jordan, okay? That's where some of the people, um, some of the tribes stayed when the Jews came into the land, right? So likewise, also all the Jews that were in Moab and among the sons of Ammon and in Edom and who were in all of the other countries heard that the king of Babylon had left a remnant for Judah and that he had appointed over them Gedaliah, the son of Achikam, the son of Shaphan. Then all the Jews returned from all the places to which they had been driven away and came to the land of Judah to Gedaliah at Mitzpah and gathered in wine and summer fruit in great abundance. So what happened was, you know, when the Babylonians came in and they took everybody and they exiled them, many of the Jews kind of ran off into other parts of the Middle East to escape the Babylonians. But when news had reached them that the Babylonians had appointed a Jewish governor over Israel, they decided to come back to Israel and to live under his governorship. All right, so it says that they gathered in wine and summer fruit in great abundance. Now, Yochanan, son of Korea, and all the commanders of the forces that were in the field came to Gedalia at Mitzpah and said to him, Are you well aware that Baalus, the king of the sons of Ammon, has sent Ishmael, the son of Nathania, to take your life? So Ishmael, interestingly enough, even though he's a Jew, he's the son of Nathania, he also apparently is a traitor. But Gedalia doesn't want to believe this report. Gedalia the son of Achikam, it says, did not believe them, right? Because it was Lashon Hara. This guy's coming and he's going to kill you. And Gedaliah was a good person. Even though he was kind of working for the Babylonians, he was doing it in order to provide uh, a, a means for Jews to stay in Israel. So uh, he didn't believe them. <clears throat> then Yochanan, the son of Korea, spoke secretly to Gedaliah in Mitzvah, saying, let me go and kill Ishmael, son of Nathaniah, and not a man will know. In other words, I'll go kill him, and that way you'll be safe and there won't be a problem. Why should he take your life so that all of the Jews who are gathered to you would be scattered and the remnant of Judah would perish? In other words, he was doing a good job, Gedaliah. And so Yochanan is like, if you get killed, we're going to be scattered, and that's going to be the end of any kind of a real presence of the Jewish people in Israel. And of course, the king of Ammon knows this, and that's why he's hired uh, Ishmael as a hitman to get you. But Gedaliah the son of Achikam said to Yochanan, son of Korea, do not do this thing, for you are telling a lie about Ishmael. He didn't want to believe him. Okay. In the seventh month, that's this month, that's Rosh Hashanah, in the seventh month, Ishmael, son of Nathaniah, the son of Elishama, of the royal family, and one of the chief officers of the king, along with ten men, came to Mitzpah, to Gedaliah, the son of Achikam, while they were eating bread together then in Mitzpah. Ishmael, the son of Nathaniah, and the ten men who were with him, arose and struck down Gedaliah, the son of Achikam, the son of Shaphan, with the sword and put to death the one whom the king of Babylon had appointed over the land. In other words, they murdered Gedaliah. Ishmael also struck down all the Jews who were with him, that is, with Gedaliah at Mitzpah, which is the majority of Jews who were in the land, and the Chaldeans who were found there also. So I guess there were um, soldiers uh, Babylonian soldiers who were there uh, probably as part of the um, the uh, what's the word the agreement made with Gedaliah you know he was the governor and then there were Babylonian um, soldiers who were there to protect the people and to ensure that everything was calm and, and whatever now it happened on the next day after the killing of Gedaliah when no one knew about it that 80 men came from Shechem, from Shiloh, and from Samaria with their beards shaved off and their clothes torn and their bodies gashed, having grain offerings and incense in their hands to bring to the house of the Lord. <coughs> so they were coming to Jerusalem to make offerings. 
Then Ishmael, the son of Nathanael, went out from Mizpeh to meet them, weeping as he went. And as he met them, he said to them, Come to Gedalia, the son of Achikam. Yet it turned out that as soon as they came inside the city, Ishmael and the men that were with him slaughtered them and cast them into the cistern. But ten men who were found among them said to Ishmael, Do not put us to death, for we have stores of wheat, barley, oil, and honey hidden in the field. So he refrained and did not put them to death along with their companions. Now as for the cistern where Ishmael had cast all the corpses of the men whom he had struck down because of Gedaliah, it was the one that King Asa had made on account of Basha, king of Israel. Ishmael, the son of Netanya, filled it with the slain. Then Ishmael took captive all the remnant of the people who were in Mitzpah, the king's daughters, and all the people who were left in Mitzpah, who Nebuzaradan, the captain of the bodyguard, had put under the charge of Gedaliah, the son of Achikam. Thus Ishmael, the son of Nathania, took them captive and proceeded to cross over to the sons of Amnon. So basically he carried them away to, um, to Arabia. But Yochanan, the son of Korea, and all the commanders of the forces that were with him heard of all the evil that Ishmael, the son of Nathaniah, had done. So they took all the men and went to fight with Ishmael, the son of Nathaniah, and they found him by the great pool that is in Gibeon. Now, as soon as all of the people who were with Ishmael saw Yochanan, the son of Korea, and the commanders of the forces that were with him, they were glad. So all the people whom Ishmael had taken captive from Mitzpah turned around and came back and went to Yochanan, the son of Karia. But Ishmael, son of Nathania, escaped from Yochanan with eight men and went to the sons of Amnon. Then Yochanan, then Yochanan, the son of Karia, and all of the commanders of the forces that were with him, took from Yochanan the son of Korea and all the commanders of the forces, sorry, ah! then Yochanan the son of Korea and all the commanders of the forces that were with him took from Mitzbah all the remnant of the people whom he had recovered from Ishmael the son of Netanya after he had struck down Gedaliah the son of Achikam, that is the men who were soldiers, the women, the children, and the eunuchs who he had brought back from Gibeon, and they went and stayed in Geret Chimham, which is beside Beit Lechem, in order to proceed into Egypt because of the Chaldeans, for they were afraid of them, since Ishmael the son of Nathaniah had struck down Gedaliah, the son of Achikam, whom the king of Babylon had appointed over the land. So in other words, they were going to run to Egypt because they were afraid that when the king of Babylon had heard that Gedaliah was killed, that they would, that Babylon, the king of Babylon would send somebody out there to kill them as well. Okay, so according to a shorter account, a shorter, which is found in 2 Kings 25, <coughs> verses 25 through 26, uh, Gedaliah was murdered in Tishrei. Actually, it said it here as well. Gedaliah was murdered in Tishrei, and our um, our tradition is that it was actually on Rosh Hashanah. But since uh, it would be inappropriate to fast on Rosh Hashanah, and, and it would also be inappropriate to mourn the, um, the death of, sorry, because it would not only be inappropriate to, um, to commemorate this man's death by fasting on Rosh Hashanah. It also would be inappropriate to mar the day or to join them together to commemorate the death of, um, of this guy on Rosh Hashanah because that's not the purpose of Rosh Hashanah. So we put off the day until the day after, um, until the day after Rosh Hashanah. So the result of the death of Gedaliah is that the remaining remnant of Jews were dispersed for all intents and purposes. The land became desolate. Um, not that there were not Jews anywhere in the land, but they were so few and far between. And uh, since the f destruction of 
the first temple and the destruction of the second temple really are linked in many regards they're they're considered in jewish literature as being two parts of one big event and when i teach the book of daniel one of the things that i believe was is that the second temple was like a second chance first temple in other words you know we made a mess and we were exiled and the temple was destroyed and hashem brought us back and he gave us the second temple to see if we would stop sinning you know it said to put an end to sin and um we failed and so you know we were given 490 years 40 of 40 and um wait a minute that's not right no never mind <laughs> anyway um it was 490 years from the beginning of the from the destruction of the first temple to the destruction of the second temple yeah so there's a 70 years and then 420 years but anyway um we were given those 490 years seven seventies sorry i said what did i say 40 40s seven seventies right um in order to try to straighten ourselves out and of course we didn't we continued doing all the stuff and more than what had brought the destruction of the first temple um so we mark the major events surrounding the destructions or the beginning of the destruction of either of those temples as beginning the be the um destruction as the beginning of the end if you will of jewish autonomy in the land of israel because even though we temporarily came back after the babylonian exile of course then the romans came in and the roman exile has been the longest exile of the jewish people it's been over two thousand years and there are a lot of debates as to whether or not our return to this modern state of israel is an end of exile and many religious authorities say it isn't because even though we're physically in the land we're still in exile because god and the torah are not the law of the land and it's a big big argument and i don't even want to get into it because i think both sides have very valid points and both sides are not seeing the valid points of the other side and it's it's just a big mess and really it's not going to get completely straightened out until the mashiach comes and tells us what it is that god actually really thinks about this whole mess okay so the passage in zachariah tells us that um we will continue these fasts until they are turned into celebrations which is only going to happen when the mashiach comes and establishes god's reign in israel and of course gives us the redemption of the world okay so that's really all i have to um share with you tonight does anybody have any uh questions or anything you want to say because we have a little bit of time left hey panina hi hannah i have a question on the calendar sure if rosh hashanah is marks the beginning of creation why is it the seventh month Tishrei? right so i said that at the beginning i'm not sure if you were here or not um but <coughs> excuse me hashem told us that nisan which is when passover starts <coughs> is going to be the beginning of the marking of our months and he said that because that was when we became a spiritual people right we were a people in egypt but we weren't that spiritual entity that has this special uh calling and purpose from god and so rosh hashanah is the anniversary of the creation of the world and therefore and the judgment of the world so in a way it's the beginning of the months for the physical existence the physical world but when hashem took us out of egypt and established us as a spiritual entity he said this month shall be the beginning of months for you so even though the rest of the world is on a calendar that starts and ends at rosh hashanah the jewish people are on a calendar that starts and ends at 
Passover. So that is the beginning of our months. Why do we still call this Rosh Hashanah? Why do we still say like a new year? Because in the physical realm, we are still, this is still the judgment day. This is still the beginning. This is the day that everything for the next year is determined and it's determined for us as well. So we have this kind of dissonance a little bit going on between the physical year and the spiritual year. The physical year begins at Tishrei and the spiritual year begins at Nisan. Right? Yeah. Anything else? Okay, Virginia. My, my clock just, t my, my computer just told me that I'm waking up in eight hours. Virginia, you're muted. So if you're trying to say something, we don't hear you. There you go. I, I was reading the story about Gedalia earlier um, this morning. And that all happened in 450 BCE. Okay. That's how long ago and how, you know, it's just so amazing to me that although he died, <laughs> how many, about 3,000 years ago, he still thought about and still mourned about um, to this day. Yeah, it's interesting how the Jewish people, we have this like memory that never ends. <laughs> um, yeah, but the thing is, is that his death was very significant in what happened to us, you know, mm. because um, it really signified a, a, a total loss of Eretz Yisrael for the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. um, because while Gedalia was still alive, technically, we had, albeit kind of only sort of, a small government in Israel still. I mean, he was only here governing because he had the permission of the Babylonian king, but he was still the governor of the Jewish people, and we still had a government in Israel. Once he was killed, that was, that was it. And, um, you know, it was 70 years before we were able to come back and to build the second temple. Uh, but things never, you know, were never quite right, even though we were back in the land. Um, we were still doing everything that we had been doing before. And so we only had uh, the temple for another 400 or so years. And, and then that was the end of that. So it's, it's very sad, you know, it's something that um, we, it, it's very, very real, the statement in the Gemara, that if we have not merited to see the Mashiach and the rebuilding of the, set of the temple, then we are as guilty of those sins as those who caused its destruction in the first place. That's wow. huge. And, and we take it very seriously, which is why we mourn all of those events, because we're really as guilty as Gedalia. And, uh, and obviously, even though there are individuals among us who are, um, you know, do tshuva and are sad and repentant over, um, over this situation, and, you know, so many people give so much tzedakah and they give uh, charity to organizations that reach out that are trying to get Jewish people to come back so that we will have enough, like a majority of Jewish people who are keeping the Torah so that Hashem will say, okay, now I see you really mean it and we're going to get this thing taken care of and we're going to, you know, make things right. And so we are keenly aware of the fact that we are just as guilty as the people who were alive during that time. And so, yeah, so that's why we still commemorate things that happened almost 3,000 years ago. Mm. It's, I think that it's part of this 
victim mentality that that the jewish people seem to have and carry around with us you know um why we don't stand up and and show strength you know sometimes we look at things that happened to not only to the jewish people but to israel and we're like why don't you just stand up for yourselves why don't you just do what's right and not care about the rest of the world um it's because we have this like 3000 year old collective guilt and so we suffer from low self esteem as a nation and when a person has low self esteem they usually can't fulfill their purpose in this world because their focus is in the wrong place and um, and uh so you know it's interesting that the human psyche is a really great metaphor for the national psyche of israel that a person who feels really bad about themselves doesn't see themselves as god sees them doesn't see themselves as worthy usually lives their entire life trying to please others and bend over backwards towards others and never really accomplishes their full um potential in this world and the jewish people have been like that for two and a half thousand years that we have this this self esteem problem and so we're unable to get beyond it and to fulfill our potential in this world and so it's the job of those of us who see this truth to work as hard as we can to bring as many Jews as we can into Torah observance so that we can change the current situation and go back to being who we really are supposed to be Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so this week coming up Shabbat is Yom Kippur and it's the only day that we can fast on Shabbat. The Torah says that it's Shabbat Shabbaton. It is the Sabbath of Sabbaths and that's how we know that it's the one holiday that can override Shabbat. And unlike all of the other holidays, because it's even when it doesn't occur on Shabbat, it is a Shabbat. So we aren't allowed to transfer a flame. We aren't allowed to cook like we are on the other holidays. Um, so, you know, even if Yom Kippur was not on Shabbat, anybody who doesn't eat, doesn't fast because of health reasons has to prepare everything ahead of time because they won't be able to cook like you can on your, on the other holidays, although I don't. I don't cook on the holidays. I cooked a whole lot last week. My freezer was so full of cooked food and I kept the, the hot plate on and I just put all of the food on there and, and that's how we heated our food. I did not do any cooking during the holiday because otherwise it wouldn't be much of a holiday for me. So, um, so Shabbat, Friday night, when we light candles, it is also the beginning of Yom Kippur. And like I said last week, about midday, <clears throat> you should have a really big meal, a festive meal, and then shortly before candle lighting, a small meal like eggs or even chicken, but something lighter, um, no wine. And, uh, and then we go into 25 hours of fasting and prayer. And for those who will be in synagogue, on Yom Kippur day, they're in synagogue for probably about 10 hours. So it's, it's a long, it's a long day, but it's incredible to see how at the end, everybody is just so excited and so full of joy at the knowledge that God said that he will forgive us. And so it's the beginning of a new slate, a clean slate and a new year. So I want to wish you all not only a Shana Tova, which means a good year, umetuka, and a sweet year. Um, and may it be written and may it be sealed. But we say gemar chatimatova, may it be finished, sealed for good. So in the end, everything should be sealed for good. I hope you all have a very meaningful uh, week leading up to, to Yom Kippur and a very meaningful day. If you can't get to uh, Yom Kippur services, then um, Obviously, you should try to spend the day doing some prayer, 
um, maybe <clears throat> look up some things online, see if you can see some recordings of, I wouldn't do it on Yom Kippur, but maybe on Friday to prepare yourself um, if there's stuff out there that's um, for Yom Kippur. And uh, hopefully I will see you next Sunday. Thanks. So thank you for joining me and have an amazing week and have a meaningful and easy fast. By the way, if you've ever wondered why people say have an easy fast, because I've heard especially a lot of people who come from other religious backgrounds feel like, wait a minute, that's like taking the easy way out. It's like a bad thing. But the truth is, is that the reason that we don't eat on Yom Kippur is so that we don't have to, we, we are focusing entirely on spirituality and we don't have to attend to our physical needs. We don't attend to our physical needs on the day. And um, one of the reasons that I explained for wishing people an easy fast is it's not supposed to be painful because if it's painful and difficult, then you're not going to be thinking about God. You're not going to be thinking about forgiveness. You're not going to be thinking about atonement. You're going to be thinking about how your head hurts and how dizzy you are and how hungry you are. And that's not the point. The point is that we're not supposed to be focusing on physicality. We're supposed to be focusing on the spiritual things. So witness, so wishing somebody an easy fast is not a bad thing. It's wishing them that they will be able to use that time to focus on the spiritual things that they need to focus on and that the physical consequences of not eating won't affect them in a negative way so that they won't be distracted from what they really need to do. Okay, so I want to wish you all an easy and meaningful Yom Kippur fast, and God willing, I will see you next Sunday.